outstanding. Amen? Amen. Hey, hello. Are y'all awake out there? Y'all have already forgotten the basic rules of worship. That means you participate. Right? There you go. You got it already. Hey, we've had a great week. I've enjoyed the heck out of this weather. And uh, yesterday, Letitia and I were out in the community. We were doing a variety of things. We participated in a 5K uh, run. We walked. Actually, we just went to get the T-shirt. <laughs> you know, when you show up to a 5K run, walk, with a cup of coffee in your hands, you, you know kind of how seriously the people are taking that. That was me. Then we went home and drank some more coffee, and then we got our dog, and we started walking some more, and we said, let's go back. We got there right about the time that the runners were running, and I said, let's go through the finish line. <laughs> no, actually, I was too embarrassed to go through the finish line. But all that is to say that the Christian, uh, our Katy Christian Ministries, was having a fun run to benefit the uh, victims of domestic violence. You may know that October is not only Breast Cancer Awareness uh, Month, but it's also uh, raising the visibility of those persons who suffer from domestic violence. Uh, many of them are neighbors. We may not even know about it, uh, but we are called to respond by being there, and we're called to be in support of those who can really make a difference in dealing with those very sad, sad situations. This morning we continue our sermon series on the care and nurture of the Christian soul through our service. You may recall that on my first sermon uh, I talked about find a need and meet it. You remember that? And you might remember I signed you some homework. What was it? Very good, and I think I told you, do that once a day for 40 days, and then it will become a habit, and I was told by my friends, that's way too long. <laughs> you discourage the people. A week would have been plenty. But I hope you continued that exercise. Um, and I know that some of you have told me stories, and you've really been uh, blessed by what God has been able to do in and through how you responded in meeting a heartfelt human need. And Mark reminded us last week that we, in our service, we are called not to stay away, but to get involved and actually to run towards the messiness of human need, to be an agent of change where people are hurting. And this morning, I want us to think about this in considering the direction of how we can meet human needs and run toward the mess, and that is to let nothing get in the way. Let nothing get in the way. Let us listen for the word of God. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in the front door. And as he was speaking the word to them, some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in the spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? 
or to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And the man stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The surprising word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. One Sunday, there were two men out on a lake. They were fishing. They hadn't... <coughs> Jesus, let me start over. <coughs> okay, Mark, step up. No. <laughs> All right, let's take two. One Sunday morning, there were two men. They were out in a boat. They had been fishing, and they hadn't caught anything. And one of the friends said to the other man, you know, we might as well just have stayed at home this morning, and then we could have gone to church. And his friend said, well, I could have stayed home, but I couldn't have possibly gone to church. Really? Why is that? Oh, you see, my wife, she's sick. <laughs> Think about it. Zig Ziglar tells a story about uh, a guy went next door to his neighbor and he said, hey, uh, can I borrow your lawnmower? And his neighbor said to him, oh, I'm sorry, you can't borrow my lawnmower because all the flights have been canceled from New York to Los Angeles. He said, what in the world does the cancellation of all the flights from New York to Los Angeles have to do with me borrowing your lawnmower. And he said, well, it doesn't have anything to do with it, but I figured that one excuse would be just as good as another. <laughs> you see, when it comes to doing or not doing what it is that we really want, any excuse will do. We human beings have become masters of rationalization we can make any excuse, any reason to get our own way or not do something that we really don't want to do. And instead of speaking the truth in love, what do we do? We give an excuse. We make up a story. We tell a white lie. And we may fool our neighbor, we may fool our parents, or even our children. We may fool a, a teacher or a police officer, and perhaps even a judge, but you know what? God is not fooled, and our excuses don't really fly with Jesus. One day, a rich young ruler runs up to Jesus, and he says to him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the scriptures. Follow the commandments of God. And then he names four or five of the big ten commandments. And the young man says, I have done all of these from my youth. And then Jesus looked at him and he loved him, and he said, you lack but one thing. Go and sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and then come, follow me. And Mark reports that the man went away sorrowful because he owned many possessions. Another disciple, upon hearing Jesus saying to him, Come, follow me. He said, Lord, let me first go home and bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Jesus had said, not everyone who says 
Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but rather it is only they who do the will of my Father who will enter into heaven. You see, not even our own sinful nature, not all of the excuses we tell God about, well, I've got certain things in my life, I've done certain things that would prevent me or disqualify me from following after you. God does not even allow our sin in the way. Paul says, after all, we have all sinned. We all stand before God without any excuse. Look it up. Romans chapter 1. You see, when it comes to God dealing with us, Jesus says that God is bigger than all of our sins, than all of our faults, all of our failures, all of our liabilities or weaknesses, we have a God for whom nothing is impossible. Let's say that together. Nothing is impossible. And if there's ever anybody who has used or or heard every excuse that can possibly be given, then it certainly must be God. Rick Warren, in The Purpose Driven Life, wrote a list of biblical characters for whom they offered up their excuses while they could not possibly do what God wanted them to do. Just a few. Abraham, I'm too old. Jacob, he was insecure. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered, Gideon was poor, Samson was codependent, Rahab was immoral, David had an affair, and he had all sorts of family issues. Elijah was suicidal, Jeremiah was depressed, Jonah was reluctant, Naomi was a widow, John the Baptist was eccentric to say the least, Peter was impulsive and hot-headed, Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman had been married five times. Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Paul had health issues. And Timothy was timid. Sound like any of you? (laughs) We're more like the people in the Bible than we might like to believe sometimes. It's really quite a list of misfits and people with liabilities. And yet, isn't it amazing that God uses all of them? And so that means God is able to use all of us to do what God is sending us to do. And we will be able to do it if we stop making up excuses And simply say, God, I'm available. I'm available. That's really all it takes. I'm available. I'll go. What excuse do you use when it comes to responding to God when you really don't want to do what you know God wants you to use? What little fabricated story do you create? What little white lie do you think would fly with God when you'd say, oh, you know, I could do it, but you know, my, I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I have no time. I don't know how. I'm afraid you couldn't possibly want to use a person like me. You see, God has already heard all of our excuses, and and Jesus has a response. And we read about it 
in Mark's gospel immediately after his baptism, and he has been driven into the wilderness to be tested by Satan, and when he comes back, he preaches his very first sermon, and his first sermon was short but powerful. It was, repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. In other words, another translation, today's uh, Common English Bible, puts it this way, change your hearts and your lives. That's what it means to repent. Change your heart and your life. Quit doing the things you used to do that have kept you away from doing the will of God. Quit using all the excuses that you give to God because he's already heard them all. Our faith is expressed not by our belief, but by our action. Some of you are sleeping out there. I see you. Maybe you've already heard the sermon this morning. I don't know. But God wants us to express our faith, to put it into action. And when we look through the scripture, this was always the case. Those who responded to God had to first say, God, I'm available. It took Mary's yes for a virgin to give birth to the Son of God. It took Peter's getting out of the boat and to walk on the water when Jesus called him to come. It took the Levites to step into the river Jordan before the waters of the Jordan would be parted that the children of Israel might walk across on dry land into that promised land. When it comes to following Jesus, we are to let nothing get in the way. And that's really what our scripture story or lesson is about today. There are four men with a friend. They've heard about Jesus. Crowds have gathered all around Peter's house where Jesus is staying and because they can't get close they take the stairs they go up onto the roof and there they begin to to dig away the thatch and the dirt that was the roof and they make this hole now it's not just a little hole is it it's big enough to lower their friend who is laying on the mat right in front of Jesus now, you know where Jesus is staying, right? Whose house? That's close. It was Peter's mother-in-law's house. I bet that went over really big with her, don't you think? First of all, Peter, you leave your family, you quit your job, you go follow this yo-yo preacher around, and now you got these nutcases knocking a hole in my, in my roof, making a mess. But Jesus isn't looking at any of that. He's looking at the man right in front of him. And he knows what the man has come for. And he looks up and he sees the men, their determination to let nothing get in the way of them and Jesus. Not even a roof. Not a crowd. Not even though it was something strange to do. And Jesus looks at the man and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then I think it's telling that the scene cuts immediately over to the corner. There's a group of Methodist preachers there. (laughs) 
Not Mark, of course. He's excluded. There's a, there's a group of old Methodist preachers over there, and they said, what, what did, you, did you hear what he said? Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. This is blasphemy. And Jesus, he sees their little huddle. He knows what they're talking about. And he says, why are you talking about that kind of thing? What would be easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, take your mat, and go home. But in order that you might see the power of God being displayed right now, right here, through me, he tells the man, rise, go home. And the man stood up. And I can imagine, you know, if this were a movie, that the crowd suddenly kind of parted. <laughs> and the man took his mat and he walked out the door. And then I bet it was just sheer bedlam. People going, can you believe it? We have never seen anything like this before. Don't let anything get in the way. God may just do a miracle in and through you. In you, because you first said, God, I'm available. And through you, because that's the way that God works through us when we're available. So friends, we've already been challenged to go find a need and to meet that need. And what I want us to do is simply take it to the next step. And that is to put aside all of our fears and doubts, the, the excuses that we give to God and say to him, I simply can't do it. I can't say hello to that person sitting next to me in the pew because I don't know them. Hint, hint. all the way to intervening to your next door neighbor who seems to be so clumsy she always falls down steps and gets a black eye. Or children whose parents are never home and they have to fend for themselves. It could be anything. Only if we're willing to make no excuses, to let nothing get in the way. Because usually, what gets in the way? I do. I get in the way. You get in the way. God's saying, get out of the way. <laughs> Just, you don't have to do anything. Just get out of the way. And you will see the amazing works of God done in you and through you to meet a real human need. So what do we do this week, friends? Find a need and meet it and... Let nothing get in the way. Thanks be to God. Amen.